Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In this lecture, number 14, I want to talk about limits which approach infinity, for which there's really two types of limits we have in mind. Uh, so one type of limit we mean as you approach infinity would be something like when the variable x itself approaches plus or minus infinity of f of x, what happens in that type of setting? Well, this leads to the notion of in behavior. Sometimes it leads to something like a horizontal asymptote. That's something we'll talk about in later videos in this lecture. Uh, the, the type of limits that, that approach infinity that I want to talk about in this video will be limits of the form where we take the limit as x approaches a from the right or the left. So a is itself a finite number, and it turns out that this limit is equal to positive or negative infinity. So the limit itself is infinite, uh, which is a different type of limit at infinity I would like to talk about. And so in this discussion, this leads to the notion of a vertical asymptote. If a left-handed or right-handed limit approaches positive or negative infinity, this is manifested as a vertical asymptote on the graph of our function. And typically that function will have, or that limit, I should say, will have the form of r divided by zero, where r is any non-zero real number. And so if you get something like a non-zero divided by a zero, that's going to give you a limit of plus or minus infinity, um, and that'll indicate you have a vertical asymptote on your graph. So we, I want to first mention some functions that we've talked about before that do have uh, vertical asymptotes. One uh, famous family of functions would be the reciprocal functions, of course. So if we think of our x and y axis here for a moment, if we take the function, say like 1 over x, you're going to get a graph that looks something like this in the first quadrant. It would look something like this in the uh, in the third quadrant there. So this would be like y equals 1 over x. I said to the first, but honestly, if you have any odd power, uh, your function is going to look something like this. And some things I can say about the vertical asymptotes of this function, this reciprocal function, it'll have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, a.k.a. the y-axis. For which you can see that on our picture right here. You have this vertical asymptote. But we can actually do a little bit better than that. Um, notice that as we approach 0 from the right and the left, we can say something about that. So as you approach 0 from the right, then your function 1 over x to an odd power is going to give you positive infinity. On the other hand, if we take the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of 1 over x to some odd power, this is actually going to give us negative infinity. As we can see, it's going off towards negative infinity there. If we were trying to graph this for even functions, let's say we looked at 1 over x squared, 1 over x to the fourth, etc. If we wanted to graph this for even functions, for which I think I'm just going to rewrite it uh, to avoid any potential confusion there, if we take 1 over x to some even power, then some things we can see about the graph will be very similar. Some things are going to be very different. We're going to see that for an even powered reciprocal function, you will still have a vertical asymptote at the y-axis. The first quadrant is actually going to look very similar, and therefore you see the same limit. The limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x to an even power, this is still going to equal infinity. Uh, the main difference is what happens to the left side of the y-axis. You're going to get something that's actually the mirror image of what you saw in the first quadrant, and therefore you're going to see a mirror image of the limits. You're going to see that as x approaches 0 from the left of 1 over x to an even power, this is also going to turn out to be positive infinity. And that's what this information right here is trying to summarize here, that whether your exponent is even or odd, if you approach 0 from the right, 1 over x to the n will become infinite. Um, on the other hand, if you approach 0 from the left, 1 over x to the n will approach either positive infinity or negative infinity. Positive infinity when you're even, and negative infinity when you're odd. And this has to do with, of course, uh, powers of negative numbers. Notice if you take negative 1 squared, you're going to get a positive 1. But if you take negative 1 cubed, you're going to get a negative 1. Even powers of a negative will give you something positive. So taking an even power of numbers that are negative but getting close to 0 will... Well, it make it positive in the end, so you get positive infinity. Um, on the other hand, if you take 
an odd power of negative numbers as they're getting closer to infinity. That's going to always be negative, and that gets you towards negative infinity here. So while you can memorize these statements, I think it's better to think about the graphs of these things. If you remember the graphs of these reciprocal functions, you can always reverse engineer these statements about limits as you're approaching the vertical asymptote of our function or not. And so this becomes even more true, I think, when we start talking about vertical asymptotes of trigonometric functions. So while sine and cosine don't have any vertical asymptotes, the other four trigonometric functions do. So imagine tangent, for example. Uh, tangent, if you approach pi halves plus pi k, where k is any integer, from the right, you're going to get negative infinity. But if you approach pi halves plus pi k from the left, then you're going to get positive infinity. That can be very difficult to forget what's going on there. It's like positive, negative. You know, it's almost like a random guess that you're going to be right half the time, but also wrong half the time. When it comes to tangent, I think it's useful, if you want to think about it graphically, uh, to think about the principal branch of tangent, right? So tangent has as its principal branch this continuous piece right here. But then when you hit pi on the right, or if you hit neg, excuse me, if you hit pi halves on the right, x equals pi halves, or if you hit negative pi halves on the left, this is where you're going to be um, hitting your vertical asymptotes. And so this is where we can ask or make statements about limits. So what I would like you to think of is the following. Okay, if you're taking the limit as x approaches pi halves from the left of tangent here, you can see that we're going to be approaching positive infinity. As tangent approach a vertical asymptote from the left, it'll go off towards positive infinity. But as we approach it from the right, we see that the limit as x approaches negative pi halves from the left of tangent of x, we're going to end up with negative infinity because of this picture right here. And therefore, because tangent's periodic, if I were to draw the picture again, I know, oh, if I were to approach, if I was to approach pi halves from the right, that's going to be negative infinity. I don't necessarily memorize these limit statements. Oh, if you approach from the right, it's negative infinity. If you approach from the left, it's infinity. What I would say is remember the picture, because if you can see the picture, you can always answer the question. Okay, let's see if tangent is approaching a vertical asymptote. From the left, it's, go, it's going to be positive. From the right, it's going to be negative. You can then figure out these things. Uh, similar statements can be said for cotangent. Um, for secant, it gets a little bit more complicated. There's actually four possibilities to consider for secant. Cotangent's a lot easier uh, because with cotangent, let me kind of erase this. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Cotangent, your picture is going to look like so. Uh, your asymptotes in a slightly different location. You're going to get your asymptotes at zero and at pi. So you get pi and zero. So if ever you're taking the limit, as x approaches any, any vertical asymptote, right? So this is going to be multiples of pi. If you approach it from the left of cotangent, you're going to end up with a negative infinity. But if you're approaching from the right, as x approaches pi k from the right of cotangent of x, this is going to be positive infinity. You can remember this from the graph, uh, which is what we're saying down here as well. Uh, let's try this one more time with, say, secant. Uh, what does your basic secant function look like? You're going to get something that looks like this, and you're going to get something that looks like this. Again, these are not the best the, the best drawn secant functions. I do apologize for that. Uh, but I, I, the intuition is what matters here, not the artistic prowess, right? You see that it depends on which asymptote you're at. So it gets a little, it gets much more tricky with secant, right? Um, so secant as the reciprocal of cosine. Um, secant will be undefined, it'll have a vertical asymptote. Whenever cosine goes to zero, which is going to happen at pi halves, uh, it would happen at three pi halves, it would happen at negative pi halves. So the exact same locations that tangent has a vertical asymptote. And so this is where we have to be careful. So if we're approaching pi halves from the left, y is going to approach infinity. But if we're approaching pi halves from the right, then y will approach negative infinity. Um, it becomes almost impossible to just purely memorize all these things, these limit statements. That is, if you take all of these limit statements in their greatest generality, it becomes very difficult. And so I would suggest when it comes to trigonometric functions, rely on the graphs. If I can think of what the graph of secant looks like, remembering the vertical asymptotes of secant and tangent,
will be exactly when cosine goes to zero. I bet you I can reverse engineer this thing. And another thing to remember about secant's graph is as it's the reciprocal of cosine, you kind of see this like bending away from the cosine curve. You can reproduce the picture of secant on demand, same thing with cosecant, and thus you could calculate these limits on demand when really is necessary. Um, the other family of functions in um, in, a tr in a in a calculus setting that we really would want to discuss that have vertical asymptotes are going to be logarithms. Uh, the natural log is a good candidate to explain what's going on here. For your standard uh, for your standard logarithm, you're going to get a graph that looks something like the following, right? y equals the natural log of x. Of course, if you modify the base, um, that'll stretch this thing. This will make this thing taller or smaller. It can also reflect, and you get something that looks like the following. Uh, in either case, though, you'll, you will have a vertical asymptote at the y-axis again, x equals 0. And so for the natural log, we see that as x approaches 0 from the right, the natural log will go towards negative infinity. It's going down, 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 down. Um, again, if you reflected this natural log uh, or any logarithm across the x-axis, you can get a decreasing logarithm like so. In this situation, then as you go towards zero from the right, you'd be approaching positive infinity. So rely on your knowledge of the graphs. The reason, honestly, I think the main reason why it's so important for you as a calculus student to be able to represent functions in different ways is that different representations have advantages. Uh, if you tried to do limit calculations only algebraically, that'll only get you so far. There are times where a graphical approach will be superior. And I think when it comes to discussing vertical asymptotes, it's very important to remember the graphs of the functions that are in play. Let's look at a few examples and see what's going on here. So if I ever had the function, or if I had to compute the limit, excuse me, the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x minus 2 over x minus 2, uh, the first thing I would be want to do is plug in x equals 2, right? Uh, because when because it's a rational function, it's continuous on its domain. So as long as the denominator doesn't go to 0, then the limit calculation will just be the function evaluation. So I'm just going to plug things in to see what happens. You're going to get 3 times 2 minus 2 over 2 minus 2 for which the denominator we can very quickly see becomes zero. That gives us some concern, but if the numerator is also zero, it means that I might be able to simplify the rational function to determine what the limit is. I have a removable discontinuity. But we see that the numerator is not, the, is not gonna be zero here. We get three times two, which is six, minus two, which is four. We get four over zero, which this indicates we don't have a removable point, but this does tell us we have a vertical asymptote. So if we're looking if we're looking for the vertical asymptotes of the function, then it's exactly these limits of the form a non-zero over zero. So we found a vertical asymptote, but maybe we wanna find a little bit more about what's going on here. So if we think about it graphically, right, what's our function doing? Well, is it maybe both sides of two go up towards infinity? Maybe one side goes to infinity, the other side goes to negative infinity. Maybe they both go down to negative infinity. Or maybe the right side goes to negative infinity, the left side goes to positive infinity. We have to investigate this thing a little bit more, okay? Because there are these different possibilities. So if we consider the limit as x approaches two from the right of three x minus two over uh, x minus two, what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna suggest a strat. I'm gonna suggest a strategy to you that is not exactly in common use, but works super well. What we're gonna do is, since we're approaching two from the right, we're gonna plug in what we will denote as two plus. So we're gonna get two plus minus two over here. All right, and we can do that in the numerator as well. It's not actually necessary in the numerator, but we'll just do it for the sake of it. Okay, and so what I want you to think about this is that when I say two plus, I want you to think about it is what if we were to pick a number that's a little bit bigger than two, all right? If you take a number that's a little bit bigger than two and you times it by three, you're gonna get something that's a little bit bigger than six, okay? And you're gonna subtract two from that. Well, if you take a number that's a little bit bigger than six and you subtract two from it, you're gonna get a number that's a little bit bigger than four, okay? On the other hand though, if you take a number that's a little bit bigger than two and you subtract from it two, you're gonna get something that's a little bit bigger than zero, okay? Uh, and so you get zero, you get four plus over zero plus. But in all reality, when it comes to a number that's a little bit bigger than four versus a number a little bit smaller than four, they're both going to be 
positive. So I can actually drop the plus on the four. I'm just going to write four over zero plus. And so, so why is it so significant for the zero here? Well, the fact that we have this form of four over zero, we know that we have a vertical asymptote. So these left and right hand the limits, they're going to be either plus or minus infinity. It's the sign that we're trying to figure out. We know it's infinite. We don't know the sign, positive infinity or negative infinity. So keeping track of signs is imperative here. So on the other hand, if we look at this thing right here, if you have a positive four on the top and you divide by something a little bit bigger than zero, that is it's positive. If you take a positive divided by a very small positive, that's gonna give you a very huge positive. Thus, this is gonna to translate to mean for us, we're gonna get positive infinity. So drawing our picture back on the screen, we see that as we approach x equals two from the right, that our function is in fact going up towards pause infinity. On the other hand, if we take the left-handed limit, so we're gonna take x as it approaches two from the left of three x minus two over x minus two, then plug in two here. For the numerator, we can get away with a two, right? You're gonna get three times two minus two on the bottom, you're gonna get two minus minus two. Because again, in the numerator, you're gonna end up with a four again. Technically speaking, it would be four minus. So that is we're, we're approaching four from the left. So we're getting numbers that are a little bit, little bit smaller than four. But in terms of a sign, again, we want something that's positive. If you're just a teeny bit smaller than four, you're gonna be positive. Um, so that symbol is not necessary. But in the denominator, which went to zero, it's significant. If we take a number that's a little bit smaller than two and subtract from it two, we're gonna get something that's a little bit smaller than zero. In particular, it's gonna be a negative number. So if you take a positive four and divide it by a negative number, which has a really, really, really small absolute value, the number will have huge absolute value, but it will be negative. And hence, this gives us negative infinity. So we see here that as you approach two from the left, you'll get negative infinity. As you approach two from the right, you're gonna get positive infinity. And so the left limit will be positive infinity, excuse me, the left limit will be negative infinity. The right limit will be positive infinity. So to answer the original question about what happens to the limit as x approaches two of three x minus two over x minus two, we see that this limit does not exist because the left limit is negative infinity, the right limit is positive infinity. There's disagreement there. Uh, let's try this again a little bit faster this time now that we've seen the technique. Um, if we plug in x equals two, you're gonna see the denominator uh, this is going to look like, well, in the numerator, you're going to get you're going to get four again. Excuse me, three times two, which is six minus two is four. But in the denominator, you're going to end up with a zero, a zero squared, mind you, which gives you just zero. So that's the form here. So again, we know there's a vertical asymptote at x equals two, but we need to learn more about it by looking at the left and the right hand li limits. If we take the limit as x approaches two from the right, you're going to have three x minus two over x minus two squared, we see that the top will be a four. Uh, two, two plus minus two is gonna be zero plus again. We, that's just like before you square it. So zero plus means we're approaching zero from the positive side. We're taking numbers that are very, very small, but still positive. So things just a little bit bigger than zero. Well, if you take something that's positive and you square it, you're gonna still get something that's positive. So you're gonna get four over zero plus, which we interpret that as positive infinity. Um, on the other hand, though, if we take the limit as x approaches zero or two from the left of three x minus two over x minus two squared, we end up with four over zero minus like we did in the previous exercise. But zero minus means we're approaching zero from the left hand side, from the negative side. If you take negative numbers and you square them, those are always positive. So zero minus squared is actually zero plus. And so this gives us pause and infinity. So what this tells us about the graph is that our function here, the approach from the right is going towards infinity. The approach from the left is also going towards positive infinity. Therefore, the limit as x approaches two of three x minus two over x minus two squared, this will be positive infinity. All right, let's look at a final example of such a thing like this. You'll notice that I did switch up the numerator a little bit. We still have an x minus two on the bottom. Uh, so when you plug in x equals two, the bottom is gonna look like a zero cubed, which is equal to zero, of course. In the numerator, it's a little bit more complicated. You're gonna have a negative, uh, let's see, you're gonna get a 12 uh, minus a 14 plus a two. That's actually zero, right? You get zero over zero. That does not necessarily mean a vertical asymptote. 
it gives you an indeterminate form. It turns out anything could be happening at zero over zero. It means we need to simplify the fraction. Uh, really what we are discovering here is that the numerator is divisible by x minus two. The denominator is obviously divisible by x minus two because it's already factored, x minus two cubed, but we need to factor the numerator. So after some effort, you can discover that the numerator factors as three minus one, three x minus one uh, times x minus two, like so. For which then if you cancel out the x minus two with one of the x minus twos on the bottom, you'll get a square there. Uh, we end up with the limit as x approaches two of negative three x minus one over x minus two squared. For which if we plug in our approach to two, we're gonna get negative three times two minus one over, I'm gonna put two to the plus minus, minus two squared right here, because we have to pay attention, are we approaching from the left or the right of two, because that gives us zero. Now in the numerator, you get three times two, which is six minus one, which is five, you're gonna get a negative five on top. On the bottom, you're gonna get zero plus or minus, squared, but like we saw in the previous example, if you square a positive, you get positive, if you square a negative, you get negative. And so in either case, you're gonna get negative five over zero plus. So look at the signs there. The numerator is gonna be negative as we get close to negative two, and the, the positive two, excuse me, and then the denominator is gonna be positive as we get close to two. And so therefore this tells us that the limit is equal to negative infinity.